Good evening and welcome to the Coon Rapids City Council meeting for Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. If you could please rise and join us for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Councilmember Kraskowiak. Here. Councilmember Ray Rauer. Here. Councilmember Hernandez Jr. Here. Councilmember Geisler. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Carlson. Mayor Cook. Here. One absent Carlson. Thank you. Uh, next item is to adopt this evening's agenda. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Griscoviak. I'll make a motion to move tonight's agenda with the exception of removing uh, consent agenda item number nine to a future meeting. Second. Motion by Griscoviak, second by Geisler to adopt the agenda, removing item nine. Is there any discussion? Hearing not, all in, hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Uh, the next, we are on to approve the minutes of the November 16th meeting. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Geisler. I'll move approval of the minutes from November 16th. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Griscoviak. Any discussion or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries one abstention, Ray Rauer. Right? Okay. All right. And item, uh, then, now we're on to our consent agenda. And we have nine items on our consent agenda, starting with the second item on this evening's agenda. To approve final payment to JL Tice Incorporated for Project 21-4 Sidewalk Expansion Gaps. Uh, the change, uh, there was a change order for landscaping restoration. The actual project costs were less than the final contract amount due to quantity adjustments from the original bid. So we're looking to approve the change order and the final payment to JL Tice Incorporated in the amount of $35,169.14 for project 21-4 sidewalk expansion gaps. Next item on the consent agenda is to approve the waiver of Christmas tree sales license fees. Um, Boy Scout Troop 212 has submitted an application to operate a Christmas tree lot at 1919 Coon Rapids Boulevard, uh, which is the Coon Rapids uh, VFW post. Uh, the troop has requested this in years past, and the council has always granted the waiver, and the Boy Scouts are a nonprofit organization, so we're looking to approve a waiver of a $90 license fee and $25 background investigation fee for Boy Scout Troop 212 to operate a Christmas tree lot at 1919 Coon Rapids Boulevard. Item four is to uh, adopt resolution 21-120, accepting a donation of $20,000 grant for rescue equipment. The fire department has received a similar grant from the Cross, or I'm sorry, from the Coss family, C-O-S-S -S family, for rescue equipment in 2018 for $10,000. The current grant of $20,000 is also intended for purchasing rescue equipment within the fire department. The grant dollars will be used to purchase equipment to improve the department's ability to perform rescues during emergency operations. So we're just looking to adopt resolution 21-120, accepting grant donation of $20,000. Item five uh, is to adopt resolution 21-121, accepting a donation of $1,500 grant for smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. And uh, the fire department, Coonabers Fire Department has received a grant of $1,500 from the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the VFW Post 9625, for the purpose of purchasing smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. The grant dollars will be used to purchase smoke and carbon monoxide detectors along with fire prevention materials for the fire department's fire prevention division. The fire prevention division will use the new detectors in their community risk reduction campaign in which they replace old, broken, or missing de detectors in homes throughout the community for free. Uh, so we're looking to approve resolution 21-121 to accept this grant 
from the VFW Post 9625. Next item on our consent agenda, which is item six, is to approve a gambling premises permit for Competition Cheer Spirit Booster Club at the Barrel House Bar and Cafe. Uh, the city received a lawful gambling premises permit application from the Competition Cheer Spirit Booster Club for the Barrel House Bar and Cafe, 11496 Martin Street Northwest. The Competition Cheer Spirit Booster Club currently holds a premises permit at this location, but a new premises permit is required due to a recent change in the establishment's ownership and the subsequent name change from Pappy's Cafe to the Barrel House Bar and Cafe. The Competition Cheer Spirit Booster Club operates at the Carboni's Pizza, Coon Rapids Billiards location as well. State charitable gambling law requires premises permits for gambling activities be approved or denied by the City Council. So with that, we're looking to adopt Resolution 21-122, a resolution concurring with issuance of a gambling premises permit for the Competition Cheer Spirit Booster Club at the Barrel House Bar and Cafe, 11496 Martin Street, Northwest. Next item on our consent agenda, which is item seven, is to approve the 2022 business license renewals. Um, city code section five contains provisions for licensing of certain establishments within the city of Coon Rapids. We have a list, a tabulation of those licenses which require the city council approval. Um, and all of the license applications are renewals. As indicated on the tabulation, most license renewals are complete with the exception of those businesses missing the indicated items. Certain licenses such as tobacco and massage therapists are approved by staff and not part of the attachment. The renewals were processed using the 2022 fee schedule. All missing items are expected to be received by Friday, December 10th, 2021. So we're looking to approve the 2022 business license renewals as listed on the attached tabulation contingent upon receipt of additional information as noted and subject to compliance with all city codes. Uh, next item on our consent agenda is item eight, and that is to approve an off sale class B liquor license for Target Corporation, 3300 124th Avenue Northwest um, Target Corporation has submitted an application for off-sale Class B liquor licensing. The investigation and license fees have been paid and the Certificate of Liquor Liability Insurance has been submitted. The Police Department is currently conducting the background investigation. The issuance of the Class B off-sale liquor license is contingent upon a successful background investigation, the issuance of a certificate of occupancy from the Building Inspections Department, and the approval of the Minnesota Department of Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement Division. Uh, so we're looking to approve a Class B off-sale liquor license for the Target Corporation, doing business as Target Store T-1144, 3300 124th Avenue Northwest, conditioned upon a successful background check the issuance of a certificate of occupancy and final approval by the Minnesota Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement Division. Um, next item on our consent agenda is actually item 10, which is to approve file, final payment to Pioneer Power Incorporated for project 19-24, West Water Treatment Plant HVAC improvements. <coughs> Uh, there were some change orders for replacing balancing valves and low point drains, relocating light fixtures in chlorine and boiler rooms, adding switches for pumps in the boiler room, removing old controls and providing new boiler controls, as well as additional control sequencing. So we're looking to approve change orders and the final payment to Pioneer Power Incorporated in the amount of $11,767.45 for project 19-24, West Water Treatment Plant HVAC improvements. And then item 11, which is actually the last item on our consent agenda, is to adopt resolution 21-129, accepting business sponsorship donations for 2021. 
The City of Coon Rapids launched a business sponsorship program in 2019 to encourage partnerships in the community related, I'm sorry, in the community related to community events and recreational programming. During its first year, it garnered several partnerships, but the program was hampered in 2020 and 2021 due to the COVID pandemic. Rather than do a formal launch of the sponsorship program in the beginning of 2021, as businesses continue to come out of the pandemic, staff gathered sponsors and in-kind donations later in the year as events were organized and came back from being canceled in 2020. The city secured several sponsorships for Night to Unite, which was held August 3rd, and several in-kind donations for the Coon Rapids Love My Pet Fair, held September 18th. RMS, a local manufacturing company, also committed to a sponsorship in 2020 for the Wreck on the Spot program. Uh, but due to COVID, the Wreck on the Spot program was canceled. The sponsorship dollars were used towards the 2021 Wreck on the Spot program instead. All funds generated through the sponsorship program help to defray costs of organizing events and programming, and businesses are provided with an opportunity to participate in enhanced marketing opportunities. And we would like to thank all of the businesses that supported events and programs in 2021. Um, we're looking to thank a Rec on the Spot sponsor, um, RMS, $2,000. That was a premier, premier event sponsor. Uh, Night to Unite, Coon Rapids Crime Prevention Association, Coon Rapids Police Association, Alloy Brewing, Coon Rapids Fire Department, Community Fund, North Star Towing, Rebel, they did some in-kind printing of event t-shirts, Raising Canes, and then for the Coon Rapids Love My Pet Fair, we'd like to thank Chuck and Don's, uh, Nothing Bunt Cakes, Home Depot, Lowe's, Jimmy John's, Cub Foods Northdale, Grand Slam, Urban Air, The Fun Lab, Cheers Pablo, Devani's, Canes, and Nutrisource. Uh, and we're looking to adopt resolution 21-129 to accept contributions made to the 2021 sponsorship program. Any questions? Do I read it again? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Uh, consent agenda has been moved by uh, Geisler, seconded by Johnson. Any discussion or questions about that? There's a lot of stuff in there. Mm -hmm. um, and all those business sponsorships were just so appreciated. And the, uh, I was down at the um, Coon Rapids Love My Pet Fair, and man, they're giving away those prizes. They get all kinds of things going on. Um, yeah, everything is great, so. Okay, I guess I didn't have anything. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? and that uh, consent agenda is adopted. We are up to item 12, which includes a public hearing. We're looking to, for a vacation of a water main easement for Paladin Career and Technical High School, 10220 Goldenrod Street. On November 3rd, council adopted a resolution requesting a public hearing for a water main easement vacation and set a public hearing date for today. Um, at the September 16th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting, um, the, and I'm gonna say it's the Paladin Charter Technical High School, I think those initials are stand for, building company received a conditional site plan approval for the remodel of the existing building at 10220 Goldenrod Street in a 13,600 square foot addition in an area that was previously a parking lot. On October 5th, 2021, Council approved a right of entry agreement to operate and verify the water main and fire hydrants on the property for public safety purposes. Rather than adjust the water main easement location, uh, the city requested that the building company vacate the entire existing easement. And then on November 3rd, Council adopted resolution 21-106 to consider vacation of the water main easement. All utilities have been notified and there are no objections the process for vac vacating an easement under the city's charter requires a public hearing and passage of a resolution. Um, does council have any questions before we open the public hearing? 
I have a feeling this will be fairly quick. We're going to open the public hearing. Is anybody here to address council on resolution 21-123, vacating the water main easement? Anybody here to address council on that? We're going to close the public hearing. And council. Somebody see the motion in there? Yep, so Mr. Mayor, Council I'll Gazer. make a motion to adopt resolution 21-123, vacating the water main easement. I'll second it. Motion by Geisler, second by Johnson. And this does require a four-fifths majority vote in favor of the resolution to vacate. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And I would like to say that I attended their groundbreaking um, about a week ago, and they are very excited. All the equipment was there, and they are rolling. Um, we are at item 13, to hold a truth and taxation public hearing and consider resolutions 21-127 and 20-128, adopting the 2022 budget and tax levy. And our city manager, Mr. Stemwittle, is at the helm there. Yes, Mr. Well, Council will be presenting this in tandem with Fran Hansen, our finance director. Uh, I just wanted to overview a few things before we jump in. Uh, tonight, really, the purpose of tonight is to hold the truth in taxation hearing, which is required by state statute. It's essentially a property owner or residence opportunity to have additional input on the budget and levy before they're adopted. And so we're required to have uh, this hearing tonight, we're also required to overview the city budget and some of the more significant changes. So that's what I'll be reviewing with you all tonight. And then after that, we would hold the public hearing and then ask council to consider the levy and the budget for 2022. From a staff standpoint, we start working on the budget very early each year, usually in April or May. Uh, but from a public standpoint, the first opportunity for folks to view it and discuss it would be when it's presented to the city council at a work session in august this year that happened on august 10th um, it's really the city council's first chance to take a look at the budget understand what's in there and what the impacts might be fast forward to september we're required to approve a preliminary levy as a part of the process that levy this year was approved on september 21st the purpose of that levy is to provide that information to the county so that they can uh, produce information for truth and taxation notices which are sent out to property owners in November. And so that preliminary data is sent to property owners so they can see the changes that are proposed from the various taxing jurisdictions on their property tax statement. There's information about the truth and taxation hearing date, time and place, again, so that they can attend if they'd like to uh, present information. Uh, so that's what we're doing here tonight. Uh, after tonight, we will be required to certify our final data to the state and county by the end of the month. And then that data will be used to calculate property taxes for next year. You know, there's several different budget principles that we use as we go through our annual budget. Obviously, one of the first things we want to do is address our core business government. Local government exists to serve a particular purpose. Um, in the case of Coon Rapids, there are a number of things that you would think of, public works, police, fire, um, all those various uh, services that provide both um, sort of outward to our customers and then internally to support those businesses. We have to make sure that they're adequately funded so that they can provide effective service to the community. We have to respond to budget needs. Every budget process has its own unique sort of theme and challenges. Uh, the last couple of years, uh, I think, have been overshadowed somewhat by uh, various things related to COVID, both in terms of strains on one end and then uh, influx of money from a federal standpoint on the other side. So it's been very interesting the last couple of budget cycles navigating that. And the other thing we really try to keep our eye on is uh, sort of long-term strategic planning with regard to capital investments, uh, to staffing changes um, in, a, in the way that we can forecast those out and start to implement some of those changes over years rather than have large changes from any one year to the next. So I'd like to just overview some of the more significant changes in our various departments. The first one being our police department. Uh, several years ago, we took a close look at staffing in police and fire and sort of recognized that there needed to be some additional investment by way of staff and police officers um, in the police department. And so there is one new general fund 
levy supported position that's being proposed in next year's budget. There was another one that we were able to obtain that actually um, started this year, uh, but will have a full impact next year through a grant process, so really two new bodies uh, as opposed to the 2021 budget. So that continues, I think it's the third year now of increasing staffing over time in that department. There are 10 police vehicles that are proposed as a part of this budget. That number is a little higher than what we would typically see, and there's two reasons for that. One is just some of it's cyclical in that a number of vehicles came up at the same time for replacement, but also because we've been adding staff, um, we need to increase the number of squads that we have available to provide adequate resources for those officers. And then thirdly, uh, a police records technician position that will support the body worn camera program. That's something that we're implementing this year into next year. And as a part of that, we really needed to invest in a staff person because there's a tremendous amount of data, public records retention, sort of pr producing them information that goes into having a body worn camera program in your police department. And this person will support that. So that was actually added this year but will fully impact the 2022 budget. Every other year we have to fund and, uh, and administer elections and next year will be our year to do that. The big change right now with elections and the way we're funding it is typically we would take the primary cost, which is the election judges themselves, the staff um, that administer those elections and budget that full amount every other year. And it was kind of a big up and down. So rather than do that, what we're doing is budgeting 50% of that cost each year and just carrying forward from a non-election year to an election year so we fully fund the election judges. Um, the advantage of that then is we kind of smooth out the peaks and valleys and then a little bit by way of supplies for the election. Oops, wrong way. And the fire department, uh, as council is well aware, we're underway with planning for a, a new fire station three that would be located on 111th and Mississippi. Uh, this project obviously would, it's, it's big enough that it would need to be bonded for. So the economic hit, the financial hit won't happen in, in one year, it'll be spread out over multiple years, but it is included in our 2022 budget. You have to kind of put it in your capital plan and have it there in order for you to have that bonding opportunity. Certainly we've done that. There'll be a lot of discussion about that project in particular here as we go for the next several weeks and months. And similar to the police department, we took a look at the staffing in the way, by way of the fire department. Um, over the last few years, we've been able to add, now uh, this will be the third firefighter if this budget is approved to that staffing plan. Um, again, uh, similar uh, approach in that the, the staffing there had remained static for a number of years. Um, it needed to increase to meet our service demands. In the world of transportation and streets, uh, we have street reconstruction, which you'll be hearing about very shortly from Mr. Hansen, uh, planning to do eight miles of street reconstruction next year. Each year we uh, try to handle a lot of street maintenance as well so that we're not needing as much street reconstruction, hopefully. And next year we're planning to either seal coat or overlay 27 miles of city streets at a cost of approximately $900,000. And then there's one dump truck that's included uh, to maintain our dump truck fleet. Uh, those trucks last about 10 years, give or take. We take a look at um, how useful the truck is toward the end of their life and give them a rating. Um, and sometimes we're able to push those back. Sometimes every once in a while we have to accelerate one because it's a bit of a lemon. Um, typically we're looking at one or two of those a year in this uh, case one. Sort of the last department area that I'll discuss is the Park Improvement Fund. There are several things happening in the budget in this area next year. We're looking to spend up the final portion of our park bond referendum that was passed by the voters several years ago. Um, the most significant portion that's left is related to trails, um, both new trails, trail gaps, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the projects we're looking at is a little more complicated than uh, some others have been in the past, and so the dollars are actually getting pushed out of 2021 into 2022 in the hopes that we can start those projects next year. We're also looking at some dog park improvements. So if you're familiar with the Bunker Hills Regional Park Dog Park, uh, which is very popular, it's a partnership between the city of Andover, over Anoka County and the city of Coon Rapids. There are a number of improvements there that uh, we're helping finance in 2022. And then finally in the park area, Al Flynn Park is the, has been designated as the next park for uh, reconstruction. This will be our, really our first major project outside of the park bond referendum. 
And so we slotted in $60,000 for consultant and sort of pre-construction work on that park so we can make some decisions in 2022, hopefully about what the future of that park is um, and how that'll impact future budgets, most likely 23 and or 24. Uh, beyond that, in our capital funds, so we have several funds that um, go to replace capital equipment. So we've talked about some of those already, the dump truck and the police vehicles. There's a couple other major ones there that are worth mentioning. Uh, we've been working the last couple of years to upgrade our sidewalk plow equipment and sort of convert it into these new sidewalk plow machines, um, which are more effective at removing snow on our, on our sidewalks. And so recent weather, I guess, makes it feel a little more appropriate that we're talking about spending $180,000 on getting a new one of those in 2022. Those are certainly worth the investment and, and much more efficient than some of the older equipment that we had. Mentioned the police vehicles, uh, information technology. Each year we budget about this amount to replace uh, some of our IT infrastructure, update equipment, that sort of thing. Um, but it's certainly not inexpensive to maintain that. Uh, our debt, so uh, we have our general fund levy, then we have levies for our debt. And so just a little overview on how that looks for 2022. We have our ICE Center debt service, which is at 852,000 for 2022, very comparable to 21. Street reconstruction is a little higher at 2.5 million compared to about 2.3 million for this year, for 2021. Um, you know, the nature of the projects, the amount of projects, and of course construction costs are all feeding into some of that. For, uh, for future years. I mean, those were a lot of projects that happened this year that are being funded for next year, that sort of thing. And equipment certificate debt service at about 90,000, very similar to 2021. Uh, this was, uh, I think, all uh, related to the purchase of a fire engine uh, a couple of years ago. And so that'll, maintain, that'll be pretty consistent over time. And then finally, the park improvement debt service, 1.1 million compared to about 1.1 million next year. Uh, that's the debt related to park bond referendum and some other related projects, so very similar. As you can imagine, uh, of a, a service area like ours, people are the main investment. About 80, 81% of our general fund expenses are related to people. Um, and so I have already mentioned uh, a couple of positions, but the, you know, adding people adds to that, that total. In this case, we are just asking for the one police officer and one firefighter. There aren't any other new positions that haven't been discussed um, at a council level or changes to personnel at this time. Uh, the budget does anticipate a cost of living adjustment for city employees. That'll be something we talk about in a couple of weeks. Um, in terms of the non-represented, we are in the middle of negotiating contracts with a couple of our unions for 2022 contracts, and we'll be starting with some others here in the coming weeks. From a health insurance standpoint, we actually uh, will be on a first year of a multi-year agreement. Uh, we did an RFP for services this year, usually get a favorable return in that first year, and so we actually realize a small budget savings in health insurance for 2022, but as you can imagine, in the future years, we'll be at some more significant increases. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Fran to talk about the rest of it. Mayor Council, citizens of Coon Rapids, I'm here to represent the financial portion of our budget. Uh, we'll start with our utility funds. The city utility funds consist of a water, sewer, and storm drain fund. In 2022 budget, the water fund has a 5% water increase in billing rates. The need for this will be evaluated in early 22 to determine whether it's actually uh, feasible for us not to raise the rates. Um, Capital improvements include 2.3 million for replacing water mains, 1.6 million for various well, pump, and rehab projects, and 820,000 for our ongoing water meter project. There's also discuss discussions continuing regarding the potential new water tower that may be built in the near future. The sewer fund has no rate increases projected for 2022. There's an increase in our Metropolitan Council environmental service fee of approximately 7% over 2021. This is a significant increase in our uh, sewer fund because the dollars are quite large that we have to pay to the Met Council. Um, also in this fund, there's capital improvements of 525,000 for sewer line replacements during our street reconstruction project. 
The storm drain fund does not anticipate any rate increases for 2022. It includes capital improvements of approximately 1 million for storm drain replacements during our street reconstruction projects. This slide compares our 2022 budgeted revenues to our 2021 revenues. Um, overall, the 2022 projected budgeted revenues have increased 15.11% over 2021. This appears to be a large number, but the significant increase is mainly in our capital projects fund um, for budgeted bond proceeds to help fund the new fire station. This slide compares the 2022 budgeted expenditures to the 2021 budgeted revenues. Overall, the 2022 projected budgeted expenditures have increased 12% over 2021. Again, this increase is mainly due to the Capital Projects Fund, and it is due to the expenditures needed to build the new fire station. The total city levy for 2022 is $30,990,539, consisting of a general fund levy, debt service fund levies, capital project fund levies. The preliminary tax rate is 38.461%. The next couple of slides will show comparisons of tax rates with other Anoka County cities and historic looks at our past city levies. This is a list of Anoka County cities and their tax capacity rates. Coon Rapids' tax capacity rate has decreased since 2019 and in 2021 was the sixth lowest rate in comparable Anoka County cities. Coon Rapids is mostly a mostly developed city. However, with new construction projects going on throughout the city over the past few years, we have expanded our tax base and as a result, our tax capacity rate has gone down. This slide shows historic tax levy increases since 2014 for the city. The 2022 tax levy in total is 4.46% higher than 2021. Please note on this slide that in 2021, the total, lax, the total tax levy in city, the city adopted was less than 1% due to the unknown effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. That rate was a historic low for the city. The average total levy increased over, the total levy increase over a nine year period is approximately 3.67% on average, with some years being higher due to budgetary needs and some years lower. City management and council work together on the tax levy focusing on investing in the future of the city while maintaining our core services. This slide shows you the median single family home assessed value for 2022 at $256,300, an increase of 6.53% compared to 2021. As assessed values increase, the homestead credit on a property decreases. With the increased value in 2022, the median family homes homestead credit decreased by approximately 9%, resulting in a net 7.61% increase in the taxable market value. The city tax capacity rate is then used to calculate the city's portion of the taxes. The 2022 proposed city tax for the median value home is $931, which is a 7.38% increase or a $64 increase over 2021. This increase is a combination of the increased market value and the home of the home and the city's tax levy. Here we have a breakdown of who receives your tax dollars and the percentage each receives based on your 2021 taxes. The school district received 36%, the city received 33%, the county received 27%, and various smaller jurisdictions received 4%. This, this fluctuates maybe 1% from different districts depending on if the school district has a, a referendum that passed or the county and the city, it all depends on how their levy adjusts each year, but it's always within one or 2% of each, so it doesn't vary much. The last slide shows you our budget and brief, which is available on our website. Please visit the website to learn more about the 2022 proposed budget. Under the city budget section, in the finance section, you will find this four page budget and brief that highlights most everything that's in the 22 budget and a really nice, compacted form. So with that, um, I'll end the presentation.
Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Hansen? I think the, the, the challenge is by the time we get to tonight, we've seen this so many times, <laughs> it's hard for us to think of any new questions. <laughs> Mr. Stemwell, do you have Pelt a question? I don't, but oh. <laughs> I was, it was worth mentioning uh, that a lot of times when it comes to this time of year, when people get their truth and taxation notices, uh, we do get some phone calls. This year, the phone calls were very low, and we only received a couple. Typically, we might get 15 or so. Uh, and 90% of those, the concerns or the questions are related to value, why their value, property value change tends to have a bigger impact in the swing of your taxes sometimes and even the increase of the, of the levy from the jurisdictions. Um, so it's always worth mentioning at this point to say mm. that when you get um, those notices for next year's process um, to really pay attention to what your proposed value is doing at that point there. In our case, we have a meeting um, of a, a board, ultimately it's the members of the city council that if someone's got concerns about their value, they can come to the council, uh, the Board of Local Appeal and Adjustment, Adjustment and Appeal, and um, Appeal and Equalization, getting my groups mixed up, thank you. And uh, ask questions about that. Um, certainly, even then, we recommend that they contact city staff ahead of time. Tonight, we actually had Rich Gruber, our city assessor, in the hallway just in case we got questions about value. Um, but that's really the time to contest or ask questions about value. When we get to this time of year, as it relates to next year's taxes, there's nothing we can do about your value anymore, and that is what it is. But for next year, if you have those questions, certainly reach out to city staff. We'd be happy to help. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the key. Tonight is the night we talk about the, the in aggregate, our, our full city budget, yep. and then in the spring you can talk about your home values yep. if you have an issue with that. Yep. All right. Did that generate any questions? <laughs> All right. Your Honor. Council Member Johnson. The first thing I'd like to do is say thank you to city staff and to Mr. Stemwell for the kind of common sense approach to presenting all this information. When you look at the many, many lines <clears throat> of the budget, it's hard to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff, and, and I think city staff does a really nice job with that. Um, and so uh, with that, I would move approval of resolution we Go ahead. Have to conduct the public hearing. Oh, we haven't we had can the... get, we can jump Oh, yeah, that's sure. yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. Besides, I'd, I'd like to point out that we've already cut out all the chaff. All we have is wheat in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so right now we're going to conduct the truth and taxation hearing. So we'll open the truth and taxation public hearing for anybody that's here to speak to council um, about the truth and taxation hearing, our adoption of the budget, whatever those things are. Anybody here to address council for that? Um, okay then, I will close the public hearing. And Council Member Johnson. Yeah, one of the things the public doesn't always see is that we're, we're basically looking out into an empty room, except I know there's one constituent out here, but I know what his item is for, so. <laughs> so um, with that, I would move then uh, the approval of resolution 21-127 adopting the 2020 tax levy. Second. So. Motion by Johnson, second by Ray Rower. Is there a discussion on that one? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that one passes. And I'll next move approval of resolution 21-128 adopting the 2022 budget. Second. Motion by Johnson, second by Griscoviak. Any discussion? No. Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Nice job, nicely done, thank you. Thank you for all your work. Mr. Mayor, I you know, just Mr. Geisler. thank Mr. Stemmel, you know, typically Mr. Demmer, uh, House Member Demmer always gave the, the spiel about, you know, how you're property taxes were based on the value and how the state does all of the calculations and we just have to follow those rules. So it was nice to, to have Mr. Stemwell to take care of that because I don't know if any of us would be ready to, to give Mr. Demers <laughs> spiel. 
Did he leave anybody a script when he went? He did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we could it. find an old video and yeah. just play it. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Well, we are up to uh, new business, and we are up to item 14 to consider the 2022 home improvement changes. Um, Mr. Grand, do you want me to read this discussion, or do you want to be presenting, or, or is there just going with any questions? Um, I can just do a, a quick recap of the changes. All right. Um, so as you, most of you are aware, um, in the past, the Coon Rapids Mortgage Assistance Foundation had been the body of, of people that kind of discussed and proposed changes to the city's home improvement programs for the upcoming year. Um, that board last year was dissolved and those responsibilities right now are with the council. So that's why we're having this discussion, at least at this level, um, with you guys tonight. Um, and just as a recap, you know, every year we do look at what the market is doing, what residents are, where their needs are, try to make sure that the programs that we offer do accommodate those needs and that they're attractive to homeowners to encourage them to do as much investment as possible to their homes, being that we are a fully developed community and continuing obviously to age. Um, the city does have a variety of different home improvement programs, whether it's home improvement, down payment assistance, um, interior, exterior, we try to address all the different needs that are out there. Um, this year, uh, there's a couple of the programs that we are proposing changes to. Um, those program or those changes include lowering the interest rate for the low interest loan program. Uh, previously, the low, the interest rates had been available at either one, two, three, or four percent interest, depending on a person's income. Um, we're proposing at this time to have available only a one percent and a three percent interest rate. Um, that would be then for um, households that are under eighty percent of area median income. And by that, I mean approximately $80,000 income for a family of four. If the household is under that income, they'd be eligible for the 1% loan. If they're above that income level, they'd be eligible for the 3% loan. Um, this just reflects what the industry right now, um, different market conditions, and what other cities in the, the community or in the, the area are offering to their residents for home improvement. Also, um, we are proposing to increase the maximum loan amount from $25,000 up to $50,000 to reflect kind of the prices that we've been seeing lately, whether it's just materials or you know contractor prices for projects to be able to accommodate and finance entire projects and not just portions of projects. Um, the next change does reflect, oh, and I'm sorry, in addition also for the low interest loan program, to increase the loan term, the repayment amount of time from 15 to 20 years just to accommodate that larger loan amount and make, make sure that we continue to offer um, affordable monthly payments for those homeowners. Um, then for the deferred loan program, uh, the deferred loan is a loan that has no monthly payment, only households that have an income limit, um, a more limited income limit are eligible and the loan is considered a 0% loan that gets paid back whenever the house is sold. So it's a very affordable option for necessary improvements to a person's property. Again, they do have to be under a certain income to be eligible, and we are proposing to increase that income limit from 50% of area median income to 60% of area median income. It's a slight increase, um, basically increasing it from approximately $52,000 a year for family of four up to um, $63,000 a year for the income for a family of four. Um, then if you are in support of making those changes to the low interest loan program, um, we could essentially eliminate the separate program that we had for the loans through the Home for Generations program. The Home for Generations program is a great program for people doing really <coughs> large interior remodeling projects where they are making a value-added improvement to their property to like a full kitchen remodel, a full basement remodel, um, bigger projects. Any project is eligible through this program, but they need to be having or include at least one of those major projects in with their scope of work to be eligible. And that needs to be $35,000 or more. Um, this program does offer grants, building permit rebates, low interest loans, and subsidized visits with architects. 
Um, but as I mentioned, if the changes are made to the low interest loan program, we don't need to have a separate pool for a loan specifically for this Home for Generations program. Um, so if those changes are made to the low interest loan program, we could eliminate the, the financing piece of that would be separate or tailored specifically for Home for Generations. Mr. Grant? Yeah. But the Home for Generations program doesn't have a cap, whereas all of these has kind of an arbitrary cap of $400,000. So if they go for the Home for Generations big project and they have a home that's valued more than $400,000, mm -hmm. then they're not eligible for any of the loans. Because um, all of these cap at 400000 Right. I believe, um, actually it doesn't come up very often and I actually don't remember. Let me double check. Okay. I just, I just remember when, when we first set up the Home for Generations, it was really critical because we were going to be, have do the open houses and we were going to publish it, so we didn't want to put a cap on the limit. We didn't want to put a cap on the home values because mm -hmm. we wanted everybody to know that we have all values of homes here and we wanted to be able to open up night, you know, the more expensive homes too. Yeah. Um, so I just curious about that. That is a good point. Okay. Um, so that being said, because I don't see it specifically highlighted in the guidelines. Um, again, it comes up so rarely. Um, so that being said, if they, if you were to keep the separate um, loan program for the Home for Generations two program specifically, um, the proposal then would be just to change the interest rates to reflect the the low interest loan program. Okay. Um, and then the last change that we're proposing at this time is for the um, Center Point Energy On Bill program. Um, now this was a program that was actually introduced in our last go around um, two years ago, but there's been a number of different um, organizational and structural um, kind of quirks as the, our administrator of the Center for Energy and Environment and Center Point had to work out. So the program actually didn't get formally or officially introduced until within this last couple of months. So we have not done any of these loans yet, but um, so we are proposing to change um, the interest rate to be one fixed interest rate. Um, before in our program guidelines, we did have, similar to the low interest loan program, we did have a breakdown of different interest rates available depending on a person's income. Um, this program is a, a one-stop shop for people who have like a furnace that goes out or some other energy-related improvement where they have a contractor come out to their house and they want to make some sort of an energy-related improvement. And those contractors are made aware um, through education through CenterPoint and the Center for Energy and Environment about this loan product. So when the contractors are actually at somebody's house, they can say, if you're interested, um, you know, I can give you this phone number and we can get you approved for financing right now today. And it just eliminates one step if, if homeowners are interested. So um, that program, we are proposing to have a flat interest rate of five and a quarter currently. Um, that interest rate may vary. We're, gonna, we're just planning to have that mirror uh, program that the Center for Energy and Environment offers. It's their, uh, I believe it's called their Easy, Easy Pay Loan Program. It's an unsecured loan program, and that's why the interest rate's a little bit higher, um, which is typical in lending industry. Um, so in addition to those changes to the program, um, we're also proposing that an additional $300,000 be allocated to a 2022 front door grant program. Um, we're not proposing any changes to the program, but just adding more money into the program since it has been so successful and very popular. Um, and then to add an additional $1.2 million into the loan program in general, and that includes the majority of the, the programs, the, the low interest loan program, the deferred loan program, the down payment assistance, the center point on bill, um, the emergency program, um, yeah, everything but the grants and rebates through the Home for Generations and the front door. Those two programs, the front door grant program and the grant and rebates through the Home for Generations program are funded um, separately. So $1.2 million added into the existing balance of the contract that we have with CEE 
to administer those loan programs. Um, currently, there is a balance of approximately 800,000, so it comes for, to a total of two, uh, approximately $2 million to cover the next two years' worth of loan activity for the programs that we've discussed. And I seem to be stuck on the same thing here, but um, one of the things I noted in here was that um, the value is to be updated annually on the property value limit. Do we have a plan for that? Because I know it's been stuck at that for three years. It's been stuck at that same value. Right. So we did bring that issue up um, at a council work session back in October, and we did um, gather information from our assessor's office um, input regarding you know what where city property values are right now for residential properties and at this time it looked as though that the four hundred thousand dollars would probably um, be adequate for the 2022 program um, but just that was kind of a side note of something that we should continue to look at because as everyone has experienced um, there's been a lot of changes in the housing market um, housing prices prices of remodeling um, materials for new construction, a variety of different things. So it's, it should be something that we continue to look at, but for now it seemed like it was, an, it was at an adequate number for those programs. Okay. And then one last thing, um, I apologize for the, the last minute, but uh, in the actual contract um, document that was attached in your council packets tonight, was the, the contract with CEE to administer the, the programs for the year 2022 and 2023, um, and also adding that $1.2 million into the budget for the programs. Um, I did add in a couple more specific items regarding their fee structure, which were not included in the, the document that was in your packet. Um, so I have those to hand out to you, but basically it just um, outlines some of the administrative costs, including the remodeling advisor visits that we offer to homeowners free of charge so they can get advice from a non-biased or, or an unbiased um, construction professional. Um, and verification visits whenever a permit is not required when a CEE um, staff has to go out to verify the project has been completed, the loan origination fees, and the um, annual administrative fee, which includes um, CEE's participation in the North, Subur North Suburban Home Show, as well as the home remodeling tour, uh, coming to council meetings and other meetings that we have to, to create the programs and make changes. So I can come up with copies of that right now. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Gershkoviak, uh, I'd just like to point out that, I mean, you mean for those at home or people that are watching, that that this is really our first time where we've actually discussed all this in an open council meeting. The fact of the matter is that um, these loans, this whole program, is it, it's not taxpayer funded. So there's nothing out of the general fund that is operating this, and that's why we had that separate entity that would do this kind of work. They would hash out all these details and then come with us. Uh, for approval on this. So I just wanted to kind of point that out a little bit. It is our first time actually discussing this in a, in a meeting in this manner. Yes, Councilor Member Geisler. Um, I was gonna follow up on your question to Mr. Grand on the, you know, kind of that limit with the $400,000 and then so that's where um, potentially that Homes for Generation, we may have to keep that other program. and. And I, I guess I remember in the conversation when we were looking at, you know, how many houses in the city are above 400,000, and it's a very, actually, small percentage. Um, and so with that, the question I have is, is it going to cost us more to try and administer that second program, or would it be simpler to raise that limit or, or remove that limit um, because there just aren't that many houses? that would come into that that range and if there's somebody in that lower income level that happens to have a higher value house that wants to do improvements, um, we would certainly want to encourage that. Sure, um, Council, so certainly there is no change in the amount of money, the administrative costs for having the additional program. The program already exists 
and we're just charged simply on how many loans are originated in any given loan pool. Um, so whether it comes out of the low interest loan program or if it comes out of a loan program specifically for home for generations, it's still the same amount of money. So it does not um, have an impact on the budget. It's just a matter of kind of trying to clean things up as to whether or not it made sense to keep the separate loan pool. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Rewiller. Uh, I just want to take a minute to highlight the value of these programs and they are outstanding. They've done, um, done the tours of some of the remodels and um, just beautiful products come out of them. I myself actually used Home for Generations a number of years ago and we added on a um, an entire family room onto the back of our house in addition to improvements in the front. Um, and that's where we spend most of our time now. So um, very value added. And the, diff the changes to these uh, I think are great. Um, a little bit lower interest rate on the low interest rate loan program. Um, expanding the income limit 50 to 60 percent. Uh, broadening it. Um, those are Excellent, allocating additional funds to the front door program, which has been very popular. Um, so I'm in support of, of those changes. Thank you. So I can take the motion and Mr. Grant, make sure that I'm gonna do it correctly. Um, so I would make a motion and number one, that we approve the recommended changes to the home improvement loan guidelines as outlined in the attached document above with the one change that we will not eliminate the low interest loan program associated with Homes for Generations 2. Um, and I will move that we authorize the mayor and city manager to execute an 11th amendment to the service contract together with any necessary documents with the Center for Energy and Environment that provides an additional $1.2 million in funding allocated to the program loan funds and extension of the service contract to December 31st, 2023, and move the allocation of $300,000 for grants in the front door grant program. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Ray Rauer. Discussion? That's right. I, to Geisler. me, it was when there wasn't an additional cost for having that other loan program, the simplest thing for us is to just maintain it so we don't have any issues with the, the housing value, so. Yeah, someday maybe I'll understand why there is that limit yeah. in there, but. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Aye, aye. opposed, <clears throat> and that motion carries. Thank you. And item 15 is to consider a feasibility report and order a public hearing and assessment hearing for street reconstruction project 22-1 and 22-2. And Mr. Hansen's already in the driver's seat. <laughs> you are in charge. Let's see if I can get the screen changed over. Uh, Mayor, Council, I, I do have a short presentation. I'm here to talk to you about our 2022 street reconstruction program. So a little bit of background, we, we sat down last summer to talk about this in work session. Uh, and at the time, uh, we had indicated that the streets that we're proposing for next year were rated this year as being in either poor or deficient condition. Uh, the streets that are proposed for reconstruction in 2022 are on average over 30 years old. And we always talk with our public works staff and, and, and make sure that we're, we're spending our time reconstructing streets where they're spending their most time patching potholes. So that's how our program was determined. The first project proposed is City Project 22-1. That's a total of 4.2 miles of local streets. It's the red area on the map on the left side of your screen. So those red streets that are generally bounded by Round Lake Boulevard uh, and 119th Avenue on the south. So all the streets to the, the east of Round Lake Boulevard, north of 119th Avenue, and then south of the BNSF railroad tracks, as well as some neighborhood streets 
north and south of 119th Avenue as you get closer to the railroad tracks, and that's generally from Cary Street to Jonquil Street and then down to 117th Avenue. And then lastly, a cul-de-sac, 117th Lane on the north side of the railroad tracks, which is a cul-de-sac in an area where we have previously been doing street reconstruction projects in the last few years, but didn't get this particular one. So the scope of the work includes resurfacing all of the, the street pavements, replacing damaged curb and gutter, repairing any sanitary and storm sewer manholes, installing any additional catch basins where feasible and where we have localized drainage problems on our street network. Uh, we'll be replacing water main valves and hydrants throughout the entire street network, but then also the water main pipes on Woodbine, Vintage, and Undercliff streets from 119th Avenue north to approximately 600 feet. That's the older part of that neighborhood, and that's where we have cast iron pipe, which is a type of pipe that they don't make anymore and is prone to, to water main breaks. We've had a number in that spot, so we're gonna replace that section only. The rest of the water main in the area is ductile iron, and it's much newer, and it's good for many more years. Uh, we also propose to construct a six foot wide concrete sidewalk on the north side of 119th Avenue from Round Lake Boulevard to where it ends just west of Wedgwood Drive. And this was actually something we didn't include in our initial presentations at the, the public open house that we had in October. So we do intend to get a letter out to the people that are affected by this sidewalk. We looked back at our sidewalk master plan and noticed that this gap was, is there, it's on the map. Uh, typically we put sidewalks, do sidewalks, and we try to line it up when we're actually doing the street. But for whatever reason, that didn't happen when we reconstructed 119th Avenue. But we figured we're close enough that we can include it in this project. So we'll be proposing that to be done as part of this project and then also upgrading any city-owned street, street lights to LED. Uh, so here's just a little bit more detail. I know it's hard to see. The, the salmon-colored streets are the ones that are proposed for reconstruction. And then these are the other areas a little bit further to the east that would be included with this project. The other project proposed for reconstruction next year is 22-2, and this includes 3.6 miles, local miles of, of streets. Uh, and the, the, the streets are generally going to be west of Round Lake Boulevard, north of 119th Avenue, and then south of Wedgwood Drive. Also will include Zia Street between Blackfoot Street and 119th Avenue, and then streets that are south of 119th Avenue, and then east of Round Lake Boulevard. The blue area shaded streets on the map to the left of the screen. So again, the, the scope of this project will include resurfacing all the asphalt pavements, replacing any damaged curb and gutter, repairing storm and sanitary manholes, uh, also uh, adding additional storm sewer catch basins where feasible. Uh, and then this project will be entirely valve and hydrant replacements throughout, no main line. Uh, uh, water main, trunk water main replacements. Uh, we'll also be proposing the construction of a six foot wide sidewalk on the south side of Zia Street, just east of Blackfoot Street. There is a, a small gap on an undeveloped property there. It's been there for many years. Uh, in a, an example like this, we would probably wait for future development, but it's this last small gap to fill in a sidewalk network that's completely the rest of it is, is already there. So we just thought this is the time to, to get that in. That makes sense. I mean, those are all the apartments in there and you've got everything yep. else going on. We have so. a lot of pedestrian traffic in the area. Uh, the the hospital's nearby. Uh, and then the other item uh, that's proposed is upgrading all of our city-owned streetlights to LED. So a little bit more detail, close-ups on, on these particular project areas. Project schedule, in January of next year, we propose to have another uh, uh, neighborhood meeting. We might have a virtual or an in-person one, uh, depending on the circumstances at the time, or both. 
Uh, February 15th is the next critical date in the approval process with the City Council, so that's when we will be proposing to hold the public and the assessment hearing for these projects. And then also approving the plans and specifications at that time. April 19th of next year, we would propose to award the, the council or have the council award the contracts for construction and then adopt the assessments on May 3rd of next year. Uh, we plan to hold in early May. Uh, we've had informational meetings in city parks, nearby city parks of the streets to be constructed uh, in advance of the work. And at that point, we have detailed schedules for everybody. We have the contractor that has been awarded the project there with us, so we can answer a lot more of the detailed questions we typically get from folks just before construction starts. And then construction would proceed generally between May and October uh, with more detailed schedules mailed in advance of any of the work. Residents will be able to sign up for notices that come out each week. Each Friday we do a generalized update, a one week look ahead of the work that we expect for the following week. Things are always subject to weather and other situations that come up during any construction project. So they are general. Um, but along those lines, we are, are working to have the ability next year to send text updates to people that sign up for it. If we have a circumstance where, for example, if the water doesn't appear to be able to be turned on by 4 o'clock p.m., which is our, our standard, and that's our requirement. Sometimes things go sideways during construction. We can't always foresee when that's going to happen. It's very difficult to notify everybody because the folks that would be doing that are trying to get the work done. So, so we're going to send generalized text updates. So we're working with others here at the city to be able to do that. And we think we have a good plan to set that up next year when that circumstance comes up, and it will. Mr. Hanson, while well, you have the project schedule there up on the screen, yeah. um, you talked about the localized drainage issues, and I know mm -hmm. often those come up from the homeowners. Yep. They'll say, hey, did you know the water collects here in front of my house? Or it, at what point do you want the homeowners to make you aware of those? I, Thank you, thank you, that's a great question. Uh, it's something that we, we brought up to residents right away, right at their, our first public open house. So all along through this whole entire process, we would ask people to, to provide that feedback. In fact, I believe we have a link on our website that allows people to fill out a short survey and give us feedback like that. We also wanna know if you have an irrigation system or a, an invisible dog fence or something like that that we might impact. Uh, we may still impact it if you tell us you have one, but it at least gets, us, gets it on the radar. We know it's there. Hopefully we can avoid it. And if they have an in-ground sprinkler system, make sure they deal with you and the Correct. contractor and no one else. Correct. If, yeah. if we damage the, re, the an irrigation, if you have an irrigation system and we damage it, the city will fix it. Uh, so we do provide the updates each Friday, and we encourage people to sign up for those, those updates. Estimated project costs. The total estimated project cost, and this includes inspection, engineering, administration, uh, construction materials, testing, is $6.4 million for 22-1. So the funding would be spread over street reconstruction fund, various utility uh, construction funds, a sidewalk fund, and assessments. And then, and, and that's 6.4 million total. And then 22-2 is estimated at 5.5 million with funding coming from the street reconstruction fund as well as utility, various utility funds, street light fund, sidewalk fund, and assessments. The 22 2022 assessment rates are, are expected, uh, they will be proposed at, for a single family resident, $2,240. Multi-family properties, duplex, townhome, apartment properties are going to be assessed at $29 per front foot. Commercial properties at $56 per front foot, and then industrial properties at $71 per front foot. This represents 4% increase over the 2021 rates. Uh, we do recognize the, 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 the challenge that assessments 
uh, do put on our property owners. So we do allow different ways for people to pay an assessment. Uh, the first option is that they can pay the entire assessment after 30, within 30 days of, of adoption, which is expected on May 3rd of next year. So they'll have 30 days after that to pay it off where no interest would be charged. After that, uh, some interest will be, will start accruing. It's 2.4. The, the, the assessments, the assessment rates are anticipated to be 2.41%. And so that if they pay between June 4th and November 15th of next year, they can pay the assessment plus any accrued interest. And then option three is to do nothing. It will simply roll on to your property taxes and get paid off over 10 years uh, with, with your property tax statement. If you choose to do that and you're a single family property, it'll cost you it will add 250, $258 to your yearly taxes, over paid over 10 years. So $250 each year for 10 years. We have reconstruction videos that talk about the entire process as well as some of the frequently asked questions that we commonly get from, from property owners. Those are available on our, our city website. Uh, and with that, I'll certainly answer any questions that council has. Uh, we will recommend, however, that the council take the following actions, that they adopt the resolutions accepting the feasibility reports, and then order the public hearing uh, for both of these projects on February 15 of next year, um, and then adopt the resolutions declaring the, assessed, or the cost to be assessed and ordering the preparation of proposed assessment rules, and then adopt the resolutions, setting an assessment hearing date. With that, I'll turn it over to council for any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Questions? Mr. Mayor? Council Member Hernandez, Jr. I have a question due to all this as well. Um, when it comes to like the street lights converting into LED lights, um, in percentages, how, how far have you gone to the completion of the project. I, I'm not, you know. Yeah, that's a great question, Council Member uh, Hernandez. So we just started updating our street lights holistically on all of, as part of our street reconstruction projects within the last few years. So I'll note that a lot of our neighborhoods are a combination of Excel, Connexus, depending on which service area you happen to live in, and then city owned. Uh, so we're only talking about the city-owned streetlights, but we're a few years into it, and we have a standard. So generally, it's a it's a post-top light or a mast iron type fiberglass pipe or a, a light pole uh, with an LED fixture that we're putting in. So we're also trying to get consistent throughout with every installation. So that helps obviously our maintenance yeah. obligations. Mm-hmm. Any other questions for Mr. Hanson? Your Honor. Okay. Council Member Johnson. The only question I ever get asked on these things um, stems from the grass or turf replacement that gets done. So on these projects, is it sod and not seed? Yeah, thank you, Council Member Johnson. Uh, I, while I always maintain that seeding is a good product, if it's watered and if the conditions are right, uh, sod is what we do now. Uh, with that said, we still have challenges with sod. Uh, it, it, if it's not watered, it dries out. You start to see gaps in it. Sometimes it settles. So we have, we still have to work through, but it, it, we certainly get, I would say, better feedback right, right off the bat when it's green right away. And, and, and the contractor maintains it for 45 days. So after 45 days, if it's good, it's, the homeowner's responsibility at that point to, to take care of it. Thank you. So, Mr. Mayor? Councilor Geisler? Since it looks like the western part of Ward 4 is getting a lot of new streets <laughs> <laughs> next year, um, I will make um, motions, and Mr. Brody, can I do them all together? If you would like. Okay, thank you. Um, make a motion to adopt resolution 22-1 sub 4, accepting the feasibility report and ordering a public hearing on improvement for February 15th, 2022. Move adopt resolution of 22-1 sub 10, declaring the cost to be assessed and ordered 
ordering preparation of a proposed assessment rule and move adoption resolution 22-1 <laughs> sub 11, setting an assessment hearing for February 15th, 2022. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Ray Rauer. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And we're up to item 16, which we've pretty well already covered. And so Mr. Mayor, Council I'll do Geisler. as well. So I'll make move adoption of resolution number 22-2 sub 4, accept, accepting a feasibility report and ordering a public hearing on the improvement for February 15th, 2022 and move adoption of resolution number 22-2 sub 10, declaring the costs to be assessed and ordering preparation of a proposed assessment role, and move adoption of resolution 22-2 sub 11, setting an assessment hearing date for February 15th, 2022. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Ray Rauer. Is there any discussion on this one? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? And that motion carries. Trying to convert or combine a couple words there. Um, and we are on to item 17 to consider resolution 21 119, supporting the 2021 Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Program application. Uh, we've got lots of discussion points on here. Mr. Hansen, do you want me to read these or do you want to hit the highlights? I can hit the highlights, Mr. Mayor. All right. So Mayor and Council, the City of Coon Rapids is working with Anoka County on pedestrian safety improvements on Northdale Boulevard at Coon Rapids High School. Uh, so we are working with them to apply for a Safe Routes to School grant. The, the maximum that we can apply for for this grant is $500,000. And the improvements that are listed in the memo, uh, which include the relocation of existing school speed, lo speed zone, uh, limit signs, uh, the addition of uh, more current or upgraded uh, uh, dynamic speed display signs, as well as uh, uh, flasher or crosswalk flasher systems, and then some sidewalk and pedestrian curb ramp updates. Um, all of those are included in here. We're working with the, the school district uh, to make sure that their concerns, any concerns that they have, are addressed with, with these improvements as well. Uh, and the grant itself, the grant application, requires a resolution of support from the local agency. All right. Anybody have any questions of Mr. Hansen? Your Honor. Council Member Johnson. I'll move adoption of resolution number 21-119, supporting a safe routes to school, SRTS infrastructure program application for the proposed safety improvements on Northdale Boulevard near the Coon Rapids High School. Second. Motion by Johnson, second by Griscoviak. Is there discussion? Your Honor. Councilman Ray Rauer. Uh, I just want to share that I am glad you're doing this and thank you for doing this. Um, as a teacher for 20 years, I did have experience of a number of bad accidents and how it affects the whole community. So um, the more that we can have safer routes to school, absolutely supportive of that. Thank you. All right, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. It's throttled back a lot from the old closing roads and moving the one lanes. Was that even before you got here, Mr. Hansen, when we were looking at that plan? <laughs> that was in 2016. Was uh, that only five years ago? Yeah, <laughs> oh. yeah well, um, six years ago almost. Um, but yeah, it, that was uh, part of a, a larger discussion that included possible additions of medians or roadway narrowing and, and relocation of access points. All of those things will, will be contemplated again in the future as I think the council's aware at, at the, the county has talked to the city about eventually taking ownership of Northdale Boulevard. Mm -hmm. and, and that will give us more opportunities to do different things to that road than perhaps we would otherwise be able to do under the jurisdiction of Anoka County. All of these improvements are contemplated to be in accordance with that happening at some point in the future, um, but that's not part of the discussion now. No, or correct. With this I grant. get it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was, that was a good answer. You were ready for it. <laughs> we are on to item 18, 
to consider planning case 21-40, consider resolution 21-125, approving a preliminary and final plat for 3525, 3531 Coon Rapids Boulevard and 34XX 115th Lane U-Haul Company. Mr. Harlicker, you, you're not, you're not going to come up unless we ask you to come up, are you? Does anybody need this presentation? <laughs> Nobody's saying no, no. so maybe, maybe we should, yeah, maybe we should see what you have. <clears throat> Uh, council members and uh, Mayor, this is a uh, preliminary and final plat um, for what uh, was for years was a Pedersen floral site. Um, the plat is being uh, proposed in conjunction <clears throat> with a uh, site plan and conditional use application that U-Haul currently has before the Planning Commission for the construction of an indoor self-storage facility. Um, what's being proposed is platting uh, what's currently three lots, uh, 1.93 acres, into one lot uh, to accommodate the proposed uh, project. Um, the uh, property is zoned general commercial, and the excuse me, the. Uh, Proposed lot meets all the dimensional requirements of the general commercial district. Um, park dedication is required for this project uh, in the amount of $9,650. Um, at the planning commission meeting held last month, the, uh, no one spoke at the public hearing and the planning commission, excuse me again, voted unanimously to recommend approval of the preliminary plat as well as um, uh, corresponding uh, final plat. Um, with that, uh, staff is recommending that uh, council move to approve the preliminary plat and resolution 21-125 granting final plat approval um, with the conditions that all engineering comments be addressed, all comments from the Noka County Highway Department are addressed excuse me, and park dedication in the amount of $9,650 uh, be uh, collected prior to the release of the plat for recording. And this is a bit, better close-up of the uh, preliminary and final plat correspond with each other. Um, and all this will be removed and replaced with the uh, uh, new uh, indoor self-storage facility. Okay. Councilmember Geisler. Um, Mr. Harlicker, just kind of a clarification. So, as we look to do um, the preliminary final plat, this is something that we can vote on. It's not contingent upon any approval of a site plan or anything else that I know is still going through the processing. Um, should that potentially not go through or something change on that, it, it's the applicant's right to not file the plat and leave it as it is. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. The, so the plat can move forward independently I just with the project sure or without the project. You know, that we understood that they're separate, they're de not mm -hmm. dependent upon each other, and that if for some reason things don't go forward, they don't have to record this, and it just becomes a moot. So um, with that, I would make a motion in planning case 21-40 that we approve the preliminary plat and resolution 21-125 granting final plat approval of U-Haul moving and storage of Coon Rapids with the following conditions of one, all engineering comments be addressed, two, all comments from Anoka County Highway Department to be addressed, and three, park dedication in the amount of $9,650 be paid prior to releasing the plat for recording. I'll second that. Motion by Geisler, second by Johnson. Discussion? Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Griskoviak. I guess I'd just like to say that I agree with, uh, I'm glad you asked that question, Councilmember Geyser, because I know at the last planning commission meeting there was some questions on the site plan, but I don't think that would modify uh, my vote to go ahead and, and vote for this plat, plat change. Yeah. For right. me, it was just important to make sure that mm -hmm. everybody in the city knew that, you know, doing this is not 
an, an, an endorsement or a non-endorsement yeah. of the site plan it, that they are two independent things. Yep. I just like seeing things move forward on that property. <laughs> That's for sure. Yep, I just want to see that old building go away. <laughs> it's common. It's common, common huh? This All right. process. Um, any other discussion on this? <clears throat> we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And item 19, while you're still up there, planning case uh, 21-53, consider resolution 21-126, Approving preliminary and final plat for Cardinal Rapids, 12511 Large Street, Cardinal Rapids, LLC. I like the name of the development, and I like the name of the company. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Mayor and Council Members, uh, this is another preliminary and final plat to plat 8.5 acres into two residential lots. The property is located on Large Street and uh, Main Street uh, Service Road. It's the property here highlighted, uh, outlined in black, and it's currently undeveloped. Um, this is a preliminary plat. Um, it involves taking this uh, 0.85 acres, plat it into two lots. Lot one would be a corner lot, and then there's lot two. Uh, this piece down here um, will be platted as right-of-way uh, for Main Street and the, uh, the service road. Access to the lots uh, will be determined at the time of uh, building permit review. Um, it's quite likely that lot two will be accessed off of the service road. Uh, lot one will have the option uh, to either access off of Large Street or access off of the service road also, but that'll be looked at uh, when they submit for building permit and how those driveways fit with the uh, curve in the street there. Uh, the property is zoned LDR2, and the lots comply with both the dimensional and area uh, requirements of that zoning district. Lot 1 is 16,430 square feet, and lot 2 is, <coughs> excuse me, 12,997 square feet. Uh, the minimum lot site is in the LDR2 zoning district is 10,800 square feet. Uh, park dedication is due as part of this plat. Uh, the amount is $4,000, that's $2,000 per lot. <clears throat> uh, Planning Commission recommended uh, unanim unanimously approval of the preliminary plat and uh, in planning case uh, 2153, um, it's recommended that the council approve the preliminary plat and resolution 126 granting final plat approval with a condition that all engineering comments be addressed and park dedication in the amount of $4,000 be paid prior to releasing the plat for recording. All right. Your Honor. Councilmember Johnson. In planning case 21 53, I move approval of the preliminary plat and resolution 21 126 granting final plat approval for Cardinal Rapids with the following conditions. Number one, that all engineering comments be addressed. And number two, that park dedication in the amount of $4,000 be paid prior to releasing the plat for recording. Second. We have a motion by Johnson and a second by Hernandez Jr. We don't have any tough questions for the developer. He's here, <laughs> you know. We, yeah, the, the, only, the only thing that, um, <laughs> that really I saw that came up at the Planning Commission meeting was concern about sight lines and, and the corner that's mm -hmm. there. And so I'm sure they're sensitive to that and we'll be um, looking at that maybe as a part of those engineering comments. Yeah, that was, it's a nice project. Yep, it is. All right, uh, we have a motion and a second. Do we have discussion, further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Couldn't even make you sweat it out, Tom, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Here, Mr. Stemwell, what did we miss? Before Scott walks yeah. away. No. Um, uh -oh. Mr. Oh. Harlecker. That's where you uh, run for the door, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I figure I'd put you on the spot while you're up there. Uh, recently announced his retirement coming up in January, and so I understand this may be his last council meeting um, before his retirement, so I thought it was worth uh, mentioning that and thanking Scott uh, during the city council meeting for his many years of service to the city of Coon Rapids and 
you've seen a lot of planning applications come your way, and we appreciate all you d you've done to get those uh, from point A to B. So thank you, Scott, and we wish you all the best in retirement. Here, here. Thank you much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure working with all of you over the years, and yeah, this is it. <laughs> You're not even thank coming you. back for our December 21st meeting? Really? Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case, I thought I'd bring it up. We'll do it again if it comes back. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, and we are up to the open mic public comment portion of the meeting. Anybody here for open mic? No? All right. I don't have any reports on previous open mics, and we are up to other business. Um, I just wanted to clarify, Mr. Hanson, I did see you did send the email yesterday. I don't know how I missed it. Um, but we had a couple inquiries about the big black pipes running on top of the ground down near 99th and Egret. And there, I, I told people you do not want to drill into that. Because yeah, <laughs> you don't want any of the liquid that's in there to be outside of those pipes. Um, maybe Mr. Hanson, just a quick What's the purpose and how, how long do they expect them to be there? Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Mayor and, and Council and, and uh, property owners or Coon Rapids residents that are at home watching this. That is all part of our Port River Walk Phase 2 Sanitary Sewer Lining Project. So it is. it starts where we left off in 2018 at what is now Zilla Street, and then it goes east, or excuse me, nor north, west, northwest, generally, generally over to Egret Boulevard. Um, so we are lining a 42-inch diameter concrete sewer pipe that's, that's buried very deep, and it takes quite a significant amount of the, the sewer, uh, sewerage of, of Coon Rapids <laughs> into that system, and it's in, in need of, of repair and lining, and that's what we're doing. We hope that it, it we, we expect it, if everything goes as planned, it should be done, and that that pumping system that is blocking 99th Avenue between Grouse Street and Egret Boulevard will be removed by the end of the month, hopefully sooner. Um, but that is the update, and that's what the project is for. Bypass we, lines moving sewage. Correct. Yeah. The, the black pipes yeah. on the surface are, are the, it's the temporary bypass. Yes. Very important. Yeah. All right. Hope they don't use those for potable water right away after this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, thank you for that. Um, we've got a, a big thing coming up Saturday, uh, December 11th, um, Saturday over at the Boulevard Plaza. We're having Coon Rapids, we think it's our first tree lighting. Now there's some rumors that it, there might have been one back in the 70s or something, but we're going with this as our first. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to start, it's going to go from 4 to 6.30 on Saturday the, the 11th. Uh, we've got um, fire, bonfires going. We've got the uh, uh, Santa coming in on a fire truck at 4.30. We've got uh, the Coon Rapids Choir starting sometime around 5.15. They're going to be taking a break just before 6 while we do the countdown and turn the lights on. And then they're going to be singing until about 6.15. And then the event's going to go till 6.30. And there, as we speak, we have our Rockies Santa Den being constructed, so we have a nice place for Santa to sit out there. Um, Anoka is borrowing us their Santa Claus chair, so we are going to have that anyway. <laughs> um, so it should be a very fun event, and we just encourage everybody to come down. Um, you're going to want to come in from Coon Rapids Boulevard on, on 111th. Mm -hmm. Come in from Coon Rapids Boulevard because the parking will be on, on the grassy area on the northwest corner of Boulevard Plaza. There is going to be um, a Blue Ox hockey game that night, so we really can't use the Ice Center parking lot, so we've got our own parking lot plowed to the northwest there. Anything else from that that I can yeah. miss? The big question that I always get on this one is, and I get it more mainly for the Anoka one because I grew up in Anoka, but the tree actual lighting and countdown is at 6, right? 6 p.m. So you got to be there well enough in advance to kind of get your spot for your photos so that you can be there when the lights go on. Yep. And, and what we're hoping for is that we have some really nice opportunities for folks to get photos. 
you know, the, the Santa, you know, the, the Santa Shack, San, Rocky Santa Den, whatever its fi this final name is determined to be. Um, well, the whole front will open, so when your kids are in there with Santa, you can get good pictures. Um, and then the tree should have some great opportunities for getting pictures around that. So it should be very nice. Not that we're competitive, but Blaine has had theirs and Anoka's had theirs, you know, so we're going to be right in the middle here and we're going to just really do it up nice. Get there early, there'll be, it uh, sounds like there's going to be some um, fire pits out there going, yep. so. Yep. We have a really cool tree, too. So yep. it, I encourage people to look at the city website and the Facebook pages and the like to see all the photographs of, of sourcing the tree here in Coon Rapids. It was great. Yep, very fun. Okay, um, let's see here. What else do we have? Um, Mr. Uh, oh, okay. I have to make an announcement. I haven't seen the quality of these yet, but back in 1986, there was a Monopoly game made for Coon Rapids. It was a Coon Rapids Monopoly game. I found out today that Walmart up north at Riverdale has a whole stack of Coon Rapids Monopoly games. It's the new edition. It's got like Cullen's ice cream and... Really? You know, and the, and the different things on it, and so I'm I'll be going there from here. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of fun. So, any uh, updates? Uh, okay. Do we yeah. want to ask Mr. Hansen about the open house on December fifteenth for the Highway six hundred and ten East River Road interchange project? Yeah, thank you, Council Member Geisler. Uh, so next uh, Wednesday, December fifteenth, between five and eight p.m. We're having a follow-up open house for the public uh, for the 610 East River Road full access interchange. We will be showing some refined concepts as well as displaying information on the feedback we have received from the public so far and then why some of the earlier concepts that we had looked at have uh, been determined not to be feasible. So we're still looking for more input input from the public and, and feedback. So uh, it's at ACAP, uh, Anoka County Head Starts facility on uh, Foley Boulevard. I don't recall the address off the top of my head, but it's north side of Foley Boulevard between East River Road and Coon Rapids Boulevard. All right, I just had it up. Yeah, 9574 Foley Boulevard. Yeah, right yes. near the park. That sounds ride. right. Yep. All right. Um, any other business to come before council this evening? Wow. This is our first one without a police chief update? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, you're going to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course I'm going to ask. Well, two things. The No Shave November that you wore the nice button for raised $2,312 for cancer. So that's one good thing. And then secondarily is the body cam project is on target. Uh, the launch for us internally would be December 15th. Uh, there's going to be no delay in implementing them on the officers, so citizens in Coon Rapids will start seeing it, mostly mounted in the center of their uniforms. Excellent. So it's on, on track. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other business to come before council this evening? Move to adjourn. Second. Motion by Johnson, second by Geisler to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned.